Bonjour à toutes et bonjour à tous, nous sommes en compagnie de David Hassel qui a travaillé chez Jagger sur les jeux Spec of the Nine et Dead Island 2 et maintenant qui a fondé son propre studio qui s'appelle In Between Games et qui travaille sur un jeu qui s'appelle All Walls Must Fall. So uh, David, thanks. Uh, thank you for having this uh, interview. My pleasure. Uh, can you uh, introduce yourself, your work, uh, what is your career, or basically? Uh, yeah, hi. I'm David. Uh, I used to work in AAA in, in, in Berlin at Jaeger. We made some games. We made uh, Spec Ops: The Line, which was a third-person military anti-war shooter that won some awards. Um, some people played, some people liked it, but not as many as we hoped. Uh, and then we uh, then we went on to make Dead Island 2, uh, which we worked on for a while. But then uh, ultimately that got handed to another developer. Um, so we didn't finish that one, and then we decided to go indie, uh, and that's what we're currently still doing with just three people. We found our own little studio in Berlin called In Between Games, and now we're working on our own game uh, called All Worlds Must Fall. Yeah, that's, that's roughly it. So we will uh, ask questions about your, the games uh, you worked uh, on. and uh, To begin with, to begin how with did you end up at Jagger? Um, well, I was studying in Berlin, uh, and so I was like studying in like media informatics, uh, something like that. And there is a mandatory in internship that you uh, have to do basically in that course of study, which is, you know, three months or so. And so I extended that to six months as long as I could, put that at the very end of my study because I thought like, okay, okay if I maybe can wind up in a video game studio, maybe I can make my break into the industry, and that totally worked. Um, so I just like um, did the internship there, and then basically just stayed there and kept on working. And uh, at some point, my university called and uh, told me that I have to actually finish my diploma thesis <laughs> because they were closing the study down. Um, okay. So, so I was just like too busy working to actually finish my study. Then eventually, I, I did that as well. So, but it was pretty hard. Yeah. So you got hired by Jaeger. Uh, I got I, uh, I got hired by Jaeger, but yeah, I basically applied there and I was like very insistent that I really wanted to work there. <laughs> <laughs> and you started by you started by working on Spec of the Line. Yes, that uh, that was the first game uh, that I worked on, so that was pretty lucky. Yeah, so what was your role? What did you do? On Spec uh, of the Line? Okay, yeah, so, well, in the beginning, so basically uh, as an intern, I, I just did like uh, a TA as it's called, so you know, technical artist basically, and and then also like a QA basically, so it was like half half, um, which is I think good if you just like start out basically testing games because you, you you know figure out all the ways that they can be broken and and you get to know like what everybody does on the team because you have to talk to them when their stuff is broken uh, and you get to learn you know what, what usually goes wrong basically so I think like starting with QA is like a, a, a good way to start into games because you know you really like and everybody really should be testing their own stuff so it's good like to, to get into that habit uh, and then yeah I did like a technical art stuff um, so basically one of the first things that I did is Um, I did something that's not very glamorous. It's, it's called a, a build machine, and that's uh, basically a server that runs somewhere in the background in every development studio. And what that machine does, it, it automatically builds the yeah, game. So, so yeah, exactly. So um, continuous integration. So it takes like all the code, all the art assets, all the audio, and tries to uh, make like a complete game out of that, like a package that you could put on a console. And most often, something goes wrong in that process because somebody threw in a wrench uh, somewhere, and then you have to figure out what went wrong and repair the machine and, and like get it going again basically which commit makes crash <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah yeah like uh, this you know uh, fan favor is like the submit and run it's like when you submit something and then just like yeah. leave the office as quickly as possible <laughs> so like by the time it breaks <laughs> you're not there anymore you know, yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah just like some stuff that you had laying around for a couple of months or something and just like push it all in and run so but this is not artistic No, it's not artistic. The, the, so the technical artist is like kind of a, a misnomer, I guess, in a way, because really uh, it, it just means like anybody that works with the content, uh, you know, like side of things that's not a programmer uh, and, and who's like uh, and who's technical. So it's like you know one of these weird kind of titles, like similar to film, where everybody's a technical director for some reason. <laughs> um, 
even though they're not a realizateur or anything, you know. Um, yeah, so, so um, like this kind of job, it's like somewhere between uh, a lot of different disciplines usually and like big companies like for example Ubisoft, if you look at their career pages, they have I think like last time I checked that like five different definitions of what a technical artist is. So basically they had five different jobs which were all called technical artists which were completely different things. Yeah, okay, so you do a lot of stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. So that was also good um, because that, you know, got me into a position where I can uh, check out like different stuff about the game. So first yes. I did like the uh, build systems and then tools and then eventually moved on to optimizing levels, making sure they actually work on the consoles. It was last gen consoles, so it was like a bit more tougher to fit everything into memory and so forth. So like load and unload stuff on, you know, dynamically without anybody noticing um, that, you know, the last room that you were just in is just not there anymore. Yeah. Um, And, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and then we uh, basically we had like these level teams where we actually like built the campaign, and then uh, at the end, like I was leading one of the three level teams that we had, uh, working uh, on, the, on the levels of the game and making building the campaign basically. So this is only where you were intern. Uh, no, no, this, okay. this was this over. Yeah, yeah, this was like the whole process. Uh, I was like over time. Uh, I was like on the. I think it was five years. Or something like that. Okay. Uh, so I was there, like from the very, very beginning until the very, very end. It took five years. Five uh, years. Uh, all in all, yeah. I mean, it probably it depends on how you count it, but it might have been longer with the, you know, previous projects and everything. But like uh, the, the part where I was involved, that was five years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, like you said before, uh, Spec Ops was uh, really unsuccessful, or at least uh, not successful enough. <laughs> And, but it has a, a great uh, critical uh, reception. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people loved uh, this game. Uh, what does it mean for you? What, uh, how do you feel? How do you feel about Spec Ops? Uh, I, I, I'm very proud um, to, to have worked on the game. I think it was absolutely worth it. Um, so, I mean, it was like five years of death march, you know, it was hard at times, so there was a lot of crunch, um, but it was totally worth it. Um, I mean, we set out basically to do like, you know, the apocalypse now of video games, and I think we did. Um, and but with everything that entails, you know, which also means that you know, Apocalypse Now didn't also didn't do <laughs> very very well uh, financially, but has like a, a, a cult uh, curse fan <laughs> yeah, curse development, very long like long hours, and you know, like the whole kind of process of development kind of bleeds into the art. You know, you can like just like kind of feel that they were like kind of out there in the jungle for too long, <laughs> and like uh, with Spec Ops, it was it was similar. Yeah, I think you know that that some of the themes that we worked on and how the team felt about the game. Um, that like kind of really started showing in the work at some point and you know and, and at some point wasn't like accidental anymore but actually became in intentional that we were focusing on this you know being oh you want a war game we, we give you a war game like how do you like this you know? it became very hard at some point to work uh, in the game yeah. yeah yeah sure like i mean it's 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 long hours um you know you work on a lot of stuff that ne never um, really sees the light of day outside uh of the studio you know because not everything can make it into a game that that's just like true for for any game out there um so yeah it's a it's a long process it can be pretty pretty tough but like in the end it was all worth it you know like when when you ship a game like that that really has like a lasting impact that um that's really really nice Because you know, uh, I don't know if you uh, if you know, but uh, Walt Williams, who is, which, who is the writer of the game, he said recently on Twitter that most of the team uh, would prefer eat glass than do an <laughs> another speak up. So, what do you think about this assertion? Uh, are you agree with it, or are you a less categorical? <laughs> I mean, it's tough to say, right? I mean, it's like uh, for, for everybody, it's the same. I think right now, uh, not the same. Like. Uh, By now we're like in the romantic kind of phase where it's like <laughs> far enough away that you know, oh, the, good, the bad old days and, and all that. Um, it, it's probably good that the game didn't get a sequel. I think it, it can, it can I stand. Think so. it, it, I think it, it stands on its own. On the other hand, um, you know, it would have been nice to do a sequel, but, but maybe, you know, do like kind of the same thing again by doing something very different. But like, I don't know, let's see. I mean, would it be... Another would, apocalypse now. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's, you know, in a way, um, the game orients on, you know, certain, like, kind of epoch in uh, uh, war movies, right? Where, where it went from the patriotic, like, kind of propaganda, basically, uh, movies into uh, anti anti war movies, you know, of like the 17s, like Platoon and Apocalypse Now and so yes. forth. But if you look at, um, you know, and, and then also Hurt, Hurt Locker and all of these, like, a bit more modern takes. Um, but I think, personally, 
um, I would love to, to work on a game, or like if I would make another anti-war game, uh, to maybe like focus on the actual um, impact that that has on the people when they come back into society. Oh, yeah. You know, like I think. Like a rainbow or something like that. Yeah, for, like the first one. <laughs> first one. <laughs> yeah, first blood. Yeah, yeah, but like like this kind of thing, or you know. Um, yeah, people coming back, basically, that the, the real-life impact of PTSD, you yes. know, of, of what that has, that maybe wouldn't be like a, a classical, you know, action shooter, but I think it would be interesting. So I still think that there is, you know, potential in this, like, like kind of genre of, like, non-conventional uh, kind of war games, uh, basically, that hasn't really fully been tapped into yet. Do you think it's possible to do it within the, the AAA industry? Because I think it's something that will be invisible. Uh, you could think about it. Yeah, you could think about it uh, within an independent studio, like you are right now, but mm -hmm. within a AAA, maybe it's a little bit ambition. What do you think about it? Well, you, you can do everything that, um, you know, you, you get the buy-in for. Yeah. Um, so, like, if, if the right people are convinced that it's a good idea to do that, um, then AAA can do anything at once, right? Um, pretty much, uh, whether that uh, in the end is like a financial success or not, that's, that's another question. Um, sometimes it's no, not the most important thing. You know, um, sometimes uh, there are studios, or big studios at least, big publishers, maybe first party as well, you know, and they just like do prestige projects basically where they want to show, okay, this is like the kind of thing that we're doing now. You know, EA also has like this kind of indie uh, flagship yes. games now, like Unravel and these kind of things. And in the end, they, t uh, you know, I, th I think turn out really, really well and, and a lot of people like them. So I, th I think you can make it work if you, you know, if, if you put all, 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 the, all your weight into it and, and you do a good job then I think you can be successful with that as well it's just hard to convince people to yeah, do it you, you need a good publisher I was thinking also about yes. Beyond Good on Evil 2 <laughs> yes. I don't know if we're, you heard about it but, <laughs> but because now it is possible only because uh, Ubisoft uh, granted the access yes uh, yeah, I mean, everybody loved the first game there as well. I mean, it's just a cult classic, so, but yeah. But it didn't sell, just as pickups. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, just like, it's a shame, but it's often how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we, sp we spoke about uh, Walt Williams. Uh, is the uh, waiter of the game? I won't. <laughs> I don't know if he's watching, but uh, I, yeah, won. I owe you a burger. <laughs> I still owe him a burger. So it was broke. <laughs> Maybe later. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, do you think that uh, the game is uh, truthful to his vision? Do you think that the team achieved to uh, make a reach game to, to uh, reach his goal? Um, yeah. What is uh, your uh, uh, yeah, I, I thought about that? Like, um, the, uh, I, I think like any game is always like kind of a, a group of effort, you know. Yes. Um, so there's uh, there's more than one creative lead, there's more than one writer. Um, lots of people need to sign off on these things. So even just like on a game like that, it's at least you know five to six people that really make the decision mm -hmm. uh, up there. Uh, and and then you have like the whole team that then like once that top level kind of thing was decided on, that uh, you know has to act on, and it goes like through the lead levels and like all the higher Okay. Um, like down to everybody that works on the game um, and, and I think we uh, succeeded in, in, in doing what we what we set out to do basically I'm not sure that it was a really smart idea to do that what, what <laughs> we were doing but like I think we succeeded uh, in you know basically doing an anti-war movie uh, as a game why don't you think it was not smart uh, well, well um, there's a, there's a it's a tough thing about games work different than movies. You know, like when you have a movie that is like maybe two hours long or so and that only really makes sense once you've seen the very end, you know, so spoiler warnings like something like Sixth Sense or, or, or Fight Club or something, you know, like where it really uh, goes and at the very end, like kind of the whole kind of thing gets rewritten, you know, but, but everything is like suddenly shifted in perspective and then you go back and experience it again and you see like a completely different story. Um, and that's easier to do, I think, in movies, not only because because of the you know, difference of whether you watch it or you play it, but just about the attention span and like how many people actually reach that ending. Um, because if you have a game, even if it's just you know seven, eight, or fifteen hours long, the actual percentage of people that see the ending is much lower than people think. You know, it's like maybe 10, 20 percent or so if you're lucky yeah, that actually, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, that that actually you know see that very thing. 
um, in, if, if you have like a backloaded narrative like that, you know, um, a lot of people will maybe play the game and not get really to the point of where it starts ticking. And that's like where I think, you know, a game like Spec Ops has this like kind of slow word of mouth where, where people go like, oh, no, I played it. Like you, you got to like play it to the end and then, you know, like it's totally worth it. But like... Uh, so Spec Ops really add this kind of player saying, oh, I just a, a third person shooter I already played. But uh, Spec Ops does this very well. I think if you look at the signs that there is something wrong, you can see them throughout all the game. Yeah. But uh, you yeah. won't notice it at first, but I, I think uh, in the middle of the game, you can, uh, it begins to... Uh, well, even at the beginning of the game, when you start fighting Americans, he, yes. uh, you can ask yourself and say, oh, this is, this is weird, this is, this is different. This is weird, but uh, you can say, oh, uh, I, I, fought, I fight the bad guys uh, again. So, uh, but uh, at, as the game uh, evolves, you... Uh, ask uh, yourself questions uh, more and more and uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that uh, it's just at the end that you uh, uh, achieve this yeah. point. Yeah, but even if you make it like to the middle and you know, like you have to make it at least until the white phosphorus scene uh, like, for, for the yes. game to, to really kick off and there's a lot of like kind of setup before that's like kind of subtle and if you, if you watch out for it you can totally notice um, but you know subtlety isn't that um, common in games, you know, so uh, like a lot of people at, at first like they're not really prepared for that kind of story um, and then and they're not really like kind of looking for that and you know like so you get like a, a, lot, a lot of weird um, like reactions like I remember like seeing one streamer like basically playing the game uh, and he played like the white phosphorus scene and he had to stop he had like a live audience and everything. It's like, well, I, I, guys, I need a break. I need to process this, you know, because he yes, wasn't uh, he it, wasn't expecting that at all. It's hard, but I think it's a good uh, thing that uh, the game can surprise the people that much. Uh, if uh, if it's shocking that way, uh, it's. Uh, so then, uh, but the anti-war uh, movie game uh, is working. Mm. That's the goal of the game. So. Uh. Yeah, yeah, it was. It's just like you know, like. It, it's not a popcorn movie, you know. It's not a popcorn <laughs> game. Uh, not really. Uh, people like popcorn, though. So, so you know, like if, if you look at it commercially, it's uh, maybe not a good idea. I think artistically, it was great. Yeah. You wanted to do something different, and I think uh, Spec Ops achieved that. Uh, yeah, 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 and it's shocking in a in a good way, you know. Like uh, it made it made me also think about uh, what you were saying about Bioshock, uh, that kind of does the same thing, not really because. Uh, it has maybe more uh, obvious signs that some things are going wrong. But uh, I don't know if you play Bioshock or Bioshock Infinite. But yeah, both of, both of them uh, managed to to get this point where at the end you can rethink the whole story. But so maybe I think it's kind of great for you to, to say, okay, we just succeeded to do this like Bioshock, you know, like games like this. But there are uh, a few games in the market actually that can do this. I think. Uh, yeah, that's true. But uh, one of the reasons why there are so few is because they commercially, unfortunately, don't do that well. Uh, if they would do, you know, if they would do better, then there would be a lot more of them. Yeah, yeah but uh, take two. Uh, for what I remember, uh, take two solid for marketing was marketing it like a, a, war, a normal war game. So and it, it could it have has, and it has a gameplay of a war game. But uh, on TPS and uh, first personal uh, shooters and then on first person, that's the major uh, difference but yes uh, 2k uh, sold it as a war game and uh, when you play it at first it's a war game uh, yeah it's a great feeling so uh, how do in your opinion how do you explain that it doesn't sell much while it was marketing like a war game it's a it's a tough thing to market you know it's yeah. uh, it's scary um it's i don't know i'm, I'm not a marketer you know yeah, like at, at that point so, so, I, so i'm not i'm not really sure um, I'm, I'm not really sure whether you know like we could have marketed that in a way that it would have uh, sold more because that was I think that's just because of the game that it is. Uh, it's it's like this kind of slow burner, you know. Again, like same way that Apocalypse Now as a movie behaved, you know, it, uh, like commercially and in, in the initial release, these kind of things don't tend to do super well because it's not really like for the for the broad market in a way. And uh, if you're successful, I think the most success that you can have is that you become you know, a, a cult hit, basically, that, that people still talk about and still reference, like, kind of years later. Um, and I think that's probably the best you can do with this kind of thing, and, and we did. Uh, so that's just kind of it. Do you know uh, how much did it sell? Uh, I think there, I don't know. I, I don't really know 
so I don't have hard numbers so any like kind of secret <laughs> info okay. un just, unfortunately just uh, an estimation because each time people are talking about spec ops they say it, it it doesn't sell much but I don't we don't know if it's one million but it was targeting five million we don't know if it's uh, one thousand or <laughs> I, I really can't say. Uh, I, I don't know. But I mean, it was on, on PlayStation Plus, I think, like for some time as well. So I have no clue, like how many people played it there. Uh, but it, it's definitely something that I think, like people still play. You know, it gets ported and, and it got ported to Mac at some point uh, and, and stuff like that. So I, I really don't know. I kind of okay. lost track. But we really have a, a great uh, reputation of our time, and that's uh, something uh, you don't achieve uh, every day. <laughs> No, no. I mean, it's it's crazy. Like for for you know, like a, a game like this, you know, like with a you know moderate budget, I would say, uh, in, in AAA space, that uh, people still talk about it. Like kind of five years later, it's like very unusual. Like um, that usually doesn't happen. Yes, but first, it happens. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, we spoke about uh, Walt Williams earlier on Bioshock. Uh, it makes me think that. Uh, some creative directors with a strong vision, I don't know if it was the case of Walt, but it seemed to be. Uh, sometimes it's hard to work with them. Uh, for example, Ken Levine is, uh, has this reputation to be uh, tough to work with because he has a strong vision and you have to stick to it. And uh, How was it to work uh, with William? Because with a person you don't know, so what can you tell, uh, tell us about this? <laughs> uh, so I've never worked with Ken Levine, so I don't know how he is personally. I also like to only know the secondhand stories, right? Um, but uh, I don't know. I I I like Walt, you know. That, that, that's fine. Um, of course, there's, there's always there's always stress within a team like that. Um, so uh, sometimes you know people butt heads, and and that's just like where. You know, if, if somebody has the direction and needs to say, no, this is what we're doing now, um, then uh, that's hard to take sometimes, right? Like, you, maybe you don't want to hear that. Maybe you wanted yeah. to make, like, a, a, a proper, like, straight-up war game where it's, like, hurrah and all that, and uh, that's not the game that we're making here, and that might be tough to take, you know? Uh, but that's just the way it goes. Um, Wall was on one of the other kind of level swarms. Like I said, we had like like three level teams that worked on like kind of different missions. So I, I never actually sweat in those same room with him. So we just like you know talked about the game for for lunch and or beers. Um, so maybe that's easier. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I worked with some of the other um, creative directors on the game more closely that were actually associated with my specific teams there. So what do you remember about uh, the re relation with uh, 2K, uh -huh. the publisher? I, I if you can say crazy. anything, I think it's still crazy and unbelievable that they um, went ahead and let us make this game, and that they wanted to make this game. And I think they deserve all the credit for that, um, because that's that's a very unusual decision. Was it very uh, idea? Um, it was definitely like a collaborative thing that and, and something that they pushed for. Yes, like you, you don't do that, you, you don't do something like that without the buy-in of your publisher. That just doesn't happen. Well, but it was a publisher of Bioshock, so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, are used to uh, Red Dead on uh, are used to uh, ambitious projects. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like they, they wanted to do this kind of thing, you know. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened. So you were not an artist, but you work with artists, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, could you t speak to us to tell you tell us uh, some things about the art direction of the game? Because the game is very beautiful. You have this kind of buried in the sun Dubai, and it's That's really quite impression. Uh, in fact, I, yeah, and in fact, I, I and, played uh, the game when it has been released only uh, because of its uh, ambience, you know. Of there is all this sand, this sun, sunstorm atmosphere, and it didn't look like uh, over, all over war games, even if the marketing wasn't seeing anything. So uh, part of uh, the reason I played this game is the art direction. So what can you tell us about it? And uh, just a few little... Uh, uh, every time I hear about Dubai right now, I think about Spec Ops <laughs> immediately. That's, that's, <laughs> It's inked, uh, it's inked. It's uh, in my on my body. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I cannot uh, forget the, the, the images of uh, the pictures of uh, Dubai that is buried. And it, yeah. All everything is dead. I think immediately of that. <laughs> yeah, I'm it's, traumatized. It's, it's funny how that goes. Like we got like immediately banned in uh, in the United Arabian Emirates. Like after the first trailer, like the first storm trailer went out. Uh, which was still like mostly a CG trailer, um, but you could see, you know, like just a vision of like destroyed buildings and the sand and the sandstorms, and we just like immediately got banned in in in, in uh, the United Arab Emirates, which which also meant that 
uh, for some weird reason, like it wasn't like easily e legally obtainable within a lot of the surrounding states because basically the UAE um, acts as a distribution hub. So everything like in the region, at least at that time, that went through physical goods, like would go through there into the neighboring countries as well. So since we were banned there, because they didn't want uh, us to, you know, have any kind of negative image, I guess, uh, associated to their real estate like kind of projects and bubble. Um, they were like, like, no, we're not having any of this. <laughs> we were like, like really, uh, like tough to uh, like obtain in, in in that region, which which was funny because we got a lot of like uh, fans actually, like uh, that were pretty happy with the game, you know. And uh, I don't know if you look at New York, New York gets like destroyed in every second, like kind of catastrophic, yes, uh, catastrophic uh, movie. It's a division. Yeah, used to it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And they they just say, oh, it's Godzilla. Yeah, of course. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. Um, so um, there was, was a question, art direction, yes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was interesting. Like, when, when I joined the project, like, immediately, like, in the beginning, it was, like, something different that I can't really talk about, but, you know, it's not the game that we, that we made. Um, basically, but there was, like, this one prototype, which was, like, a small thing, that actually kind of looked similar to this one, which was, like, kind of just filled with sand, so and just, like, one, like, kind of subway station or something where the sand was, like, kind of drowning in, uh, flooding in, and then, like, a, a one street corner around it and and that just like worked uh, so strongly that uh, and, and the sandstorms um, um, that like kind of the entire artistic vision I guess like kind of was shaped around that and also like some classical painters where you you know like uh, juxtapose these like kind of unorganic uh, skyscraper like kind of shapes with you know the organic sand and the fertility of a man's ambition you know and every, uh, all that kind of it's like there, there are really strong themes there so that, that works really well I think um, and yeah, I mean, we just like we, we just put a ton of time into the game. Yeah. You know, it's like over five years. I mean, it was crazy. Uh, we we had like um, color scripts for every room, so there were like these like giant posters where you know every single room in the game is like the the, the color uh, kind of uh, of evolution of like oh I don't know here's like green and now it turns into oranges and so forth and uh, I don't know if you play the game you know you notice but basically you're only going down all the time like in the entire game you're only going down we had we we had we had levels where you were going up and those were cut. You know, because it, they just like didn't fit with the theme, basically, like narratively, they didn't serve any purpose uh, of, of what the game was supposed to be doing. Um, so it was like a lot of it is just like you know, um, yeah, evolutionary process. If you work on something for that long, you know, just you just throw away all the things that don't fit, and you keep the stuff that fits, and it just like develops organically. Can you tell us uh, something about uh, the sound design on the music? Because it's also things that have been very important in the, uh, within the Spec Ops experience. But, mm. Like the, the sounds are very loud and uh, very punchy. And even when you are listening to the soundtrack, you you can can go back into Spec Ops universe mm. just just by li by listening to it. Yeah, I, I do that sometimes. I, I mean, I had it like when I was just had my music running. Uh, Spotify and and I think and I think I'm fine and then something from Mogwai comes on, uh, <laughs> you know, like the what is the Glasgow Mega Snake or whatever it was, and it's just like and also like some other tracks that we had in the game. Not all of it actually made it into the final version, but I just like listened to them for you know six months at a time because I was working on that one level and that was the music of the level. So if you like work on it, you know, you just have like that song like Tom Waits or whatever like half in your ear like half a day. Uh, um, so it's like immediately when I when I hear these songs, it's like completely triggering um, <laughs> PTSD <laughs> and I'm immediately back there I, I didn't really have anything to do with that um, you know with the song selection or like the audio or, or what I did there was I made sure that we had the, all the volumes in place so that all the you know all the rooms were covered basically um, or this is like a room this should have like this echo and, and so forth but I just like set up basically ge the geometry of sounds basically and then the sound from the speakers yeah there's a speaker so I did like you know technical placements kind of stuff and make sure like you know, so in a room like this, you would have like some kind of volume, so like a cube, and you make, need to make sure that it has like the right shape so that the echo and the reverb and, and like sound occlusion like works correctly, and that's the kind of stuff that I did. But I didn't actually like tweak the sound or, or anything like that. Okay, but, uh, we have done with Spec Ops, I no, guess. I have, no. have one last question, no, one last question. <laughs> which is. Why there is a multiplayer in Spec Ops the line? <laughs> because it's a question we don't we don't have any answer. So if you can, uh, <laughs> we didn't play it uh, at all. <laughs> I, I didn't make that decision, so I really don't know. Okay. Yeah, I think it came from from uh, 2K, 2K. Maybe. Well, I don't know. You know, it was a, it was the time where 
And we're still in that time, right? Like everything needs a multiplayer. Like there's there's, there's, there's certain like kind of themes that I, I don't hardly change. Think so because like there are speakers and there is a, there was a reboot of Tomb Raider that had the multiplayer too, and all this multiplayer were not played at all mm. because playing uh, people who are playing this game are playing it for a single player campaign. So I think. Either you have a multiplayer on the game, it is strongly multiplayer on some time as a campaign, like in the very new Star Wars Battlefront, for example, mm. or Call of Duty. Either your game is solo, on, I don't think you need a multiplayer, but because it's not played then. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, if you look at the really, really big games, um, you know, ideally you, you, you want everything. You know, you want you want you want an awesome single player campaign, and you want an awesome multiplayer uh, part as well, and an awesome co-op. Um, and and some people will just play one of these, and some people will play all of them. But you just want them to know, you know, if you want this kind of experience, this is the game that you buy because it has like it's a complete package. Um, and commercially, that's just how it goes. Um, of course, if you really want to focus um, and, and make like the best version of one of those, it, it might be better if you would just do one, but that's that's just not how the market works, I guess. Yeah, um, it doesn't really fit with Spec Ops multiplayer. Yes. I, I really like the, the co-op though of, of, uh, of Spec Ops, which I don't think much people actually play it because it came out as a I DLC. I don't remember as it was. Like yeah, <laughs> it, it, came, it came out as a, as a DLC thing, but I, I thought it was actually oh, okay. pretty cool. Like, uh, so it was like cooperatively and, you, you know, like kind of way based kind of things uh, and it was interesting because like some of the stuff that you know in a narrative driven game like that that you don't even notice that are there like we had like a we had a, a super dynamic battlefield AI you know that could adjust to anything but like within the normal game they basically weren't allowed to because only all you do all the time is like no you go there now and you do this and um, so you were like constantly just like basically whipping your AI to, to do exactly what you wanted to do at that exact point of time so that like, kind of fits the whole progress of that linear kind of uh, thing and like with the co-op it was a lot more like kind of free form and like the AI could actually you know show off what it can actually do when it's let free uh, and that was that was pretty interesting um, so yeah I don't know uh, we'll have to see I would, I would love like some more, more co-op out there I don't know yeah, we'll, we'll yeah, to, to check this is to go into darkness together. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that can be interesting. I, I loved, like, I don't know whether you guys played that, but, like, Canon Lynch, if you actually played that. Yes, and, played and, it. Uh, yeah. I played it, but solo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's also, you, you gotta you gotta play it in, 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 in co-op, because, like, yeah, they actually, like, they have the crazy guy, I don't know which... Yes, we're going Lynch. To, it was Lynch, right? And if you play as Lynch, basically, at some point, you know, like, you see other stuff than the other person, so it's, oh, like, okay. similar to Spec Ops, where you have, like, these hallucinations, but it's in co-op, and only one of the two sees, like, the hallucination, so basically you see like civilians and they look like cops so you shoot them <laughs> and your co-op partner goes like what the fuck <laughs> why are you shooting the civilians you go like he had a gun so you're basically totally in character for, for Lynch you know who's oh, like crazy because I guess uh, Lynch uh, shoots uh uh, people also yeah. <laughs> every time. I was, I was playing that and uh, I was playing that in co-op. We played it in split screen, so we yes. you could actually see like what was happening. But yeah. that was that was amazing. Well, yeah, that's yeah. a very good design decision. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought uh, Kenny Lynch was uh, a great idea, but uh, not well executed. Uh, but it, uh, it's still uh, uh, an IP that uh, I like. Uh, I would like that they do a, a third, but uh, with better uh, ambitions. Yeah. But that's uh, another another topic. Yeah. <laughs> so is there any uh, last thing you would like to share about Spec Ops and experience something whatever? <laughs> Maybe a conclusion. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we made the game and excited that uh, the people uh, still talk about it. Uh, you know, I, I, it's five years later. Yeah, it's five years later. Uh, it's uh, ten years since yeah. the beginning of the game. So, somebody, somebody should like put it on the uh, current gen consoles. That, that's what I would like to see. That would be nice um, to see it. You know, that it keeps being accessible, basically. But it's on Steam, so you know, people can always play it. So that's good. So today, okay. <laughs> if you are looking at us, there is a remaster, I think. Yeah. But I think a remaster could work because now uh, that the game has a good reputation, I think a lot of people could buy it. And, yes. Uh, and if you make it on Switch, as there is no game, <laughs> I don't know if it's the There's right no game, game for... like it on Switch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's the right game for Switch, but... Uh, I think oh, there is Doom now. <laughs> yeah. I think it could run on Switch. Yeah. <laughs> Now we will talk about uh, Dead Island 2 mm -hmm. because uh, uh, soon after, uh, soon, I don't know, uh, after uh, Spec Ops, uh, Jaeger uh, worked on, on Dead Island 2. The first, first one was developed uh, by uh, Techland. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up uh, working on uh, Dead Island 2? 
but I just worked at Jaeger and that was like project that we worked on next. Uh, <laughs> so I was, um, you know, pretty much um, per default. Uh, and yeah, like I'm, that's that's pretty much like how that went for me. Did you know how, how you did you get the license? Sorry? Do you know how do, did you get the license? Uh, at Jaeger. Why uh, no, Jaeger uh, was? I'm not involved in that kind okay. of stuff. That's above my okay, was so. a, was above my pay grade. <laughs> okay. And what was your role on that island? Uh, so on the, that island too, basically that's where I really like started working as a designer uh, mostly. So like at the by the end of Spec Ops, I was like a technical designer. So I actually uh, put together the demo um, that, that there is like for for Spec Ops. You know, so uh, put that together basically for a bunch of other people. Uh, and then on, on that island we did some other stuff, you know, other prototypes and so forth, like between those projects where I also like did more design stuff. Uh, and then on that island I basically started out in the beginning, I was a technical designer, so I did a lot of prototypes for different stuff. Uh, and then basically just like kept going into the design direction and just like did uh, game design and, you know, RPG elements and characters and abilities and spawning and loot and uh, fire systems and whatnot. Yeah. So lo lots of things. So you were a, a game designer on uh, Dead Island 2? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the game was cancelled. <laughs> uh, at least... It was uh, uh, handed uh, to another developer. Yes, yeah, so uh, Sumo, Sumo Digital. Uh, it's uh, Sumo G Digital. Yeah, who is now working on it, officially. So, so you, you can say anything at all about uh, why it ended uh, for Jaeger? Uh, I don't know, I, I can't really tell you, you know, we just got told we're not working on that game anymore and that that's it. And that sucks. And then we went day drinking because it was the middle of the day and we got, we got told, oh, you're not working on a game anymore. So we got like really, really drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so what we will do now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's like basically where we started wondering about, okay, like what do we do next? Uh, you know, and like people made, made plans, you know, like uh, it happens within the games industry, not, not all the projects work out. Uh, I think it's unusual that it's uh, that publicly that people actually notice most of the games um, that you know don't get shipped. Uh, you never hear about because they never actually make it to the stage where they are uh, officially announced out there. Like you know, actually we even played this this yeah, game because yeah, it, we it, played it at uh, Paris, Ge Paris Game Week uh, mm -hmm. two years ago, mm -hmm. two, uh, yeah, yeah, third, yeah, yeah. three years ago. ago. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We had like a Gamescom demo and uh, everything, so yes. uh, that we put yeah. together. But uh, so, what was your direction for the Dylan Two? Because I remember that. Silver said uh, Jagger uh, wasn't working anymore on the project because of uh, direction uh, uh, differences. Like yeah, they, they did not have the same vision of you. So yeah, sorry guys, I, I don't think I can really talk <laughs> okay. about that. Oh, yeah. Okay, we no totally problem. understand, <laughs> but we had to ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we will pass on the Dylan Two, which is uh, still a, a secret uh, kind of project. So what we can say is that you decided to leave and to create your own company. So uh, first question, why did you decide to leave Jaeger? And second question, uh, why be going indie? Uh, so at that point, like for me personally, uh, and like for a bunch of other people that uh, worked on uh, that island and some of the other stuff we worked before, uh, it had been like a really long time um, since we shipped something. You know, like uh, Spec Ops was a long project, took five years, but at the end we shipped it, right? And it was great. So you get like that huge payoff of, of, of five years of work. Um, but when you spend like three or four years and it basically, you know, it amounts to nothing, um, that it is, um, which, you know, it's not true because you learn a lot and, and all, yes. of, all of that kind of soft and nice stuff. Uh, but really, at first, it feels like you know somebody just like burnt down the the work of the last four years of your life. Uh, that's pretty. That's a pretty bad feeling. Um, so um, at at that point, we just said, okay, like we don't we don't want to have that risk anymore of somebody else like having that kind of control over our um, creative uh, output. Basically, you know that when when you work on something, we wanted to own it ourselves and uh, just be sure that we can put it out there. Um, if somebody doesn't like it, that's fine. We don't care. Uh, we will just you know we we will just like make this and and put it out there. We just needed to finish something and then have people play it. Uh, and that was like the most most important thing like for us at that point so we really had um, I think emotionally no other choice yeah. but uh, to just say oh no I, I really I, I can't work for somebody else right now because I couldn't deal with another bad breakup <laughs> you know so I just like need some time we just needed some time for ourselves um, so we just like made a jam game at first right so we did the Ludum Dare um, game jam in just three days uh, with like four people 
uh, and then uh, some some guests <laughs> that that came in to to help us with uh, voice acting and stuff like that. And in just like in three days, we made a little game about like a mammoth and uh, the story of the mammoth. And it's like a this cave painting game and had like kind of a fairy tale narrative, and it doesn't end well. <laughs> uh, so it's like this really really sad story, and that's like kind of where we were grieving and we were you know just expressing that okay like this is how it feels to lose something and when you can't do anything about it um, and we just like put that in a game and um, because we needed to make a game and then like, like put it out there and have people play it and um, it was like free game you know it takes five minutes to play it and, and all of that but uh, like for the small scope that it had uh, it was you know pretty well received and then we said okay yeah we, we are actual game developers we, we can do this we can make games so let's let's, let's keep doing that uh, and, and that's where we decided okay like we have to we have to go indie um, that's just what we have to do uh, and then you know started developing concepts uh, that we, we would like to work on and ultimately decided to make uh, All Worlds Must Fall uh, which is the game about Berlin and uh, you know it's like kind of a cyberpunk game and music is really important and, and all of these things and we just like threw together a, a lot of things that we liked and uh, eventually we figured out how they all connect uh, and, and figured out okay like it's a kind of tech noir story basically that uh, is focused on the Cold War and time travel and it's still like kind of difficult to explain but um, yeah it's like just what we, what we wanted to work on so that's what we're doing So why did you choose this game as your first project this idea? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we had like a, a bunch of other ideas uh, which were um, not that close to us maybe, you know, where it was like again about like making a game that is somewhere far away, you know, like Dubai is a far away place and, uh, you know, Rapture is a far away place under the <laughs> sea. Like if you, if you look at games, a lot of these games are like far away places somehow. These places to live. Yeah, they're... <laughs> are Rapture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they have this like kind of fantastic like Itopomar, like across the ocean, there is like some other, like, in, you know, in a galaxy far away a long time ago that kind of stuff uh, and, and but instead we wanted to do something that you know was really close to us basically and where, where we knew how it worked and that maybe wasn't covered in games that much uh, and we thought you know like Berlin and how Berlin really is like today but also like how it was like in the time of the division uh, is something that is not super prominent uh, within games because usually you know like if you're uh, if you're German, you know, and you're in a video game, you, you're you're prob you're probably a bad guy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's it. It's, it's yeah, usually how. Yeah, what first time to uh, just uh, release? The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that seems to be good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, because uh, we didn't tell it, say it, but uh, you are uh, German, you lived in Berlin, so yeah, it's like not uh, obvious for everyone who is watching. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm, I'm actually, I'm the only German on the team, um, so we're like three people, and uh, Isaac is from the UK, uh, Rafael is from Poland, uh, and I'm from Western Germany. So we all like, kind of moved to Berlin. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's a pretty good representation of, you know, like uh, what the people in Berlin are because they're kind of from all over the place, uh, and it's like so it's like kind of its its own thing. Um, but we also like really wanted to reflect the club culture, basically, you know, Berlin nightlife uh, within the video game. And then we also, you know, we saw John Wick. And we're like, holy <laughs> hell, yes, we're gonna make like a, a nightclub uh, yes. tactical shooter and with time travel. And it's gonna be awesome. So you're only three people. We're only three people. Oh. Yeah, we had like a composer, audio lead, uh, and she helped us with the music and with the sound effects. And then we got like a, a bunch of other people, basically that we collaborated with because music was very important for the game, and we wanted to. Um, you know, I have like this feeling of you're in a club, so it's different kind of styles of this like kind of electronic music. Um, so it's really cool um, to to work with uh, some of these people. And we have like Mona Moore, uh, for example, did like a track. She also worked on Kane and Lynch, uh, like that's the audio for for um, I think the Dog Days there. And she's like, you know, like very classic kind of uh, Berlin scene uh, m music that she did there. And the track for us is all especially like very like kind of 80s. Um, and, and like really like this bunker like kind of music so really um, really proud of that and uh, we have Ben Franti uh, on the soundtrack who, who worked on FTL and you know it's like just a really lovely person in general and love his music so it was really cool um, to get a, a track from him as well and we got a track from Kuzilek as well who did the music for uh, Luftrausers and Nuclear Throne um, so it was really cool and a bunch of other uh, people also like kind of local uh, Berlin uh, techno producers basically you did like some really nice Nice, authentic, um, like Berlin techno tracks, even though they're from London. Uh, but that's, you know, like just uh, how the city is. Yeah, because uh, music is really important in uh, All Wars Must Fall because uh, all missions took play, take place on uh, nightclubs. Mm -hmm. uh, that goes bad <laughs> with people on. 
uh, <laughs> Alf Nicky, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yes, well, they're, they're only half naked though. Like in a real club, they would be naked. <laughs> but that was good. It's a <laughs> I've been in Berlin. <laughs> yes, in Berlin. That's, that's yeah. exactly how that's it happens. How it goes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, okay, what, what you, you've been on the dance floor and suddenly there's like somebody naked next to you. And that's oh, okay. That's normal. Cool. Yes. Yeah. So what, uh, uh, we went to Berlin, but only three days. We need to, to go back. <laughs> but, yeah, could, could you just sum up what is the game for, for people who are watching us and really don't know about it? Okay. Um, is, uh, so all walls, uh, all walls must fall is a tech noir tactics game. So it's like an isometric um, game where you control time traveling secret agents that have one night of clubbing to prevent a, a nuclear strike in, uh, in a Cold War Berlin in the future uh, where the wall still stands and that will lead to a nuclear war. Um, but uh, luckily they have a time machine so they send their secret agents like back one night and basically say okay like somebody has to figure out what happened and that's your mission to then basically find out uh, who did it and how to prevent it and obviously all of these missions uh, happen in Berlin nightclubs uh, because you know like James Bond goes into casinos and, <laughs> and our agents just go to Berlin techno clubs that's okay. because the Berlin uh, is famous for his nightclubs uh I don't. We don't know Berlin that much, but yeah, uh, we don't know if it's uh, really famous for its nightclub. So that's a question about Berlin. <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, there's definitely like a certain, I think, like style of music. Uh, you know, uh, techno, like kind of EDM stuff that is like really strong in Berlin, uh, and that has a long tradition in the city. Um, that also, you know, basically comes from the history of, of the city. When when the wall went down. Um, suddenly there were all of these like kind of derelict industrial buildings that were just like empty um, so people would go there and do parties basically and um, you know uh, have very loud music and all kinds of substances and light uh, and, and, and that's like how that club culture basically that's still going to gay like uh, today like um, was born and, and there's a, there was a strong relationship as well I think like within the music scene between Detroit uh, and Berlin of this like kind of industrial um, techno and electronic music yeah, I remember I saw a, a movie called uh, Victoria mm -hmm. that, uh, I haven't seen it I haven't seen. it's, uh, it's uh, in Berlin it's uh, <laughs> only uh, one sequence shot movie uh, about uh, Uh, ah, yeah, so yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a girl who parties. Yeah, a girl who parties, and then go to a haste, and then uh, she has an, in only once uh, shot movie. Nice. Uh, and the, she goes at uh, two parties in the same movie. <laughs> and uh, the, so I remember it while we were speaking, and that's the way. I, I understand why uh, um, there may be importance uh, in Berlin, uh, those nightclubs. It could be famous. Uh, Yeah, I mean, like, it's a, it's a big part of the, you know, like, local uh, nightlife uh, culture, I would say. So that's, uh, like, one of the things that we did, like, when we started out with the games, we just, like, went into clubs, basically, and did, like, research. That, that, that's a good excuse. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> to go party. Uh, it was for research. Yeah, okay. um, and you can say this to your wife, and, you know, I was, I was working <laughs> every night of the week. <laughs> <laughs> for, for some time, yeah. Uh, no, somebody has to do it. Um, <laughs> So, um, but yeah, it's interesting. I and mean, the thing is, like, these are places that you usually you, you don't really see. Um, you don't really see like how they really are because cameras are forbidden. There are no uh, like no cell phones, no cameras. There, are, there aren't even mirrors. Um, um, so it's like a, a, a very like kind of secluded uh, kind of subculture where um, kind of everything goes. Um, so it's a, it's a it's a quite special place, um, and and we and, and at the same time, like the music is very prevalent and lighting, and all of that happens in these like kind of weird brutalists, uh, you know, like uh, techno bunkers. So it's a it's a quite specific feeling that we wanted to convey there, um, basically, and that's also like why all the actions like happen on the beat of the music because that's basically like how the en en entire thing works. So to get back to the game, it's a it's a game that is very different. Yes. compared to what uh, you did uh, before. Yes, so why did you decide to make a tactical game? You didn't do that before, so... Uh... Yeah, I mean, like, uh, on one hand, we, we, we stuck to our guns with a few things, so we're still using, like, the same engine and all that, so we, we know how to do, like, the, the technical things. Um, but we wanted, you know, we didn't want to do, like, another third-person or first-person shooter. Uh, also, it would be insane to 
try to do that with just three people. Like, I mean, you could do it certainly, but you probably, you know, you do like one room or maybe two rooms, yes. uh, and try to do those well, and that's like kind of all you can do there. Um, so we thought, yeah, we, we just like try something old school Thai based. We we really want, also wanted to, you know, make a game that was similar to the games that got us into games in the first place. You know, when we were still playing and we were playing like Syndicate or like the first XCOM and these kind of games, like these 90s PC games, where we really like kind of for ourselves like figured out, oh, holy hell, I'm gonna make video games. That's what I'm gonna do with my <laughs> life. Um, so so we wanted to like kind of go back to the roots there and and just like kind of make make that kind of dream true uh, by, by just like working on something that was like kind of old school and, and retro like that yeah, your game is uh, interesting because uh, it has combat uh, combats fi fights and there is also uh, uh, talks uh, uh, dialogue, dialogue uh, features that, that uh, fits qu quite well uh, can you tell us uh, about it um, yeah, well, what we wanted to do is like we wanted to make something where you, as a player you get like kind of a sandbox of a simulation of a nightclub and um, you know it really like start out you, you know you're on a club and you think what if I would be a secret agent now you know and, and like I had a mission to do something and then like oh, what, <laughs> yeah what, what, what could you do you know like oh maybe I could sneak around there or maybe I could you know and then you have to convince the bouncer to let you in uh, or maybe at some point you have to to fight some bad guys you know or you just like do some dancing I don't know um, so, we, so we wanted to have like um, to offer like different approaches to player on to players like how to basically fulfill their mission without saying oh this is like how you do it and this is like what you have to do now um, so we have like these different pillars of like basically combat um, dialogue and, and time travel uh, is what we have in the game. You can also hack some stuff, but it's like pretty lightweight. Um, and yeah, especially the time travel stuff that that's really like kind of mind bending because you. I didn't see uh, them in the game as uh, a time travel thing. Mm -hmm. I played uh, a little as a game, but I didn't. Uh quite understand the time travel uh, thing. Basically what you can do with the agent that you have right now, so the agent that you have is Kai and he's like kind of a war veteran so he represents like kind of the past and uh, basically all his time abilities are about traveling back in time so the one thing which is the simplest thing is just an undo so basically you do any you, you do any choice and you just do an undo so you haven't done that so maybe... Undo you, or rewind. Yeah exactly so, so you did so maybe you took a step and then you got shot you don't want to get shot uh, so you undo that or you have a dialogue and you say something Thing that maybe uh, you shouldn't have said and then you undo that but the good thing is you know what would have happened so then it's when it starts to get interesting you, you can look into a room and then not have looked in the room so you save the time to check that room and check a different room instead so and uh, and then where it goes on is like the rewind for example that only rewinds the world around you but not you so imagine you you go down the hallway and that takes like a couple of minutes uh, like a couple of seconds uh, but then you un re you rewind that time you're still at that point but for the rest of the world that didn't ever happen so essentially you just teleport it um, so you can, you know, make your way through combats uh, and, and make these combats then not have happened. And you can open doors and, uh, and then have, close them behind you without ever having opened them and, and that kind of stuff. Because uh, the time at your disposal is a feature important in the game. Mm -hmm. You have to do the, the levels uh, uh, step as soon as possible, mm -hmm. as fast as possible. Yeah. Uh, Yes. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, on the other hand, you also like you know you can basically uh, collect resources, which allow you to use your time abilities. Yes. Um, and so by winning combats, uh, discovering rooms, so it's a bit like Schrödinger's uh, cat. You know, like you, uh, why we haven't checked the box yet. The cat is like both alive and dead. So basically, like um, exploring the rooms and requiring certainty to these uh, clubs, which are also procedurally generated, so different all the time. That basically gives you powers to then uh, use these time abilities. Um, so it's a balance between like doing things that reward you and like doing them as quickly as possible. But what as quickly as possible means is like kind of in flux if you have a time machine. So. There is something we did not say. It's that the game is still in early access. Yes. This is why uh, you are saying that we still uh, you, to, you still have to work on this or on this. And, yeah. And uh, do you know? Uh, have you a plan for the early access? Do you know how many, how many time? How much, how much time? Uh, yeah, we, ah. we have a plan, but the plan is like kind of always shifting, yeah. right? Uh, so, so at this point, what we what we're thinking about doing is like we want to reach like. Um, a, a, a finished uh, version of the game uh, at the beginning of next year um, so that we, we have like our first uh, story arc at least like of that first agent and we can call it like kind of finished you can play it like all the stories in place and you can actually play that uh, as an episode basically um, so that's what we want to uh, finish until the beginning of the year and, and then we will see how it goes from there uh, or like yeah we, we don't really know yet we'll have to see 
Uh, a question about the, the settings of the game, uh, the, his story, because uh, as you said, it's in Berlin, it's, in, it's during the Cold War in uh, uh, 2089, so uh, 100 years after the... Uh, and the, the end of the Cold War. Well, the end of the Cold War, but uh, when it's not the end. In the game, uh, does this game have a, a meaning, a story that you uh, a you purpose? Want to, to say something special about this game. Um, yeah, we. I mean, we do. I mean, it's kind of like in the title, right? I mean, all walls must fall. I mean, it's, it was like. That a, is wall. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there was like the there was the big Berlin Wall, right? And there was like a chant, basically, when there were demonstrations that brought the wall down, which was like the wall must fall. So it's basically like an extension of that, that all walls must fall. So, um, you know, the message there being the barriers are bad. You know, that, that we that we think uh, seclusion uh, is, is bad. Uh, basically, and um, yeah, what the consequences of that are, uh, or, or what what people or what, what you will do in the game, basically, to make that happen, or whether you, you're part of that or not, that that will be you know the decision of the player, uh, basically. Um, but yeah, uh, it's a, it, it does have a message in in, in in that kind of realm that we hope uh, people can connect to. Okay. Okay. And the last question about it: uh, the game uh, uses a feature that it's permadeath. Mm -hmm. uh, if you die, uh, you can uh, reload. Uh, mm -hmm. You just have to start a new campaign. Uh, that happened to me when I tried the game for uh, one hour and a half, yeah. and then I died. I just don't understand why I died. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I just had to. Uh, Uh, start a, a new campaign. Yeah. I didn't do it because I didn't have t time. But uh, why uh, it's uh, permadeath? What's um, it? It's yeah, I mean, like, so the game is like kind of like a, a roguelike, you know. So, so it's like procedurally generated. So the attention intention definitely is that you 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 play the campaign like kind of more than once, ideally, because hopefully uh, it will be varied and interesting enough to like play it multiple times. We did make the permadeath uh, optional though uh, by yes. now. So, so like you, you know, there are certain achievements that you will only get like if. if If you do a permadeath campaign, but if you really don't want to bother, um, then you can just like uncheck that option. So that's like part of the feedback that we got basically. So we're also like permanently just like reacting to the feedback that we get on the game and then implement new features uh, based on that or, or fix stuff. I like how you do uh, feedbacks on the game. There is a, uh, in the screen, there's a, a lot of place to uh, do feedbacks. Uh, Uh, for instance, in the dialogue screen, uh, yeah. you can. Uh, there is a, uh, does this sentence uh, look uh, bad? Uh, yeah. uh, tell us about it. Uh, is, I, I haven't seen uh, any other games that uh, do feedback that well. Uh, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the the feedback aspect that was really important to us because we, you know, come from AAA game development where you just like sit uh, secluded in your office, basically you're not allowed to talk to anyone about the game, um, like even years later sometimes. And then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we we definitely wanted to do like kind of the opposite of that, and and we wanted to be free about uh, about the development of the game and be able to directly connect to players. So it was super important to us. So that's why we directly integrated that into the game, basically. So that. that There's like these uh, feedback buttons within the game where you can directly send us messages and uh, they get stored and we, we go through those basically and, and see how we can, uh, can improve the game. But, you know, also ask people for feedback on Twitter and, and Facebook and like uh, Steam forums and all of that. But um, we think it's also important that you can just like give feedback while you're playing the game because that's when you think about it and maybe you saw something weird uh, and, and that helps us improve the game. Okay, thanks. So I think one last question. Uh, uh, it's a yes, question. Uh, before that, just one. Uh, <laughs> but it's not about uh, it's not about uh, all was all but uh, about uh, in between games. Uh, what are your ambitions with uh, that studio? We have these four games right now, but uh, have you intend to do more uh, after that? And uh, yeah, I mean, we, we don't really know. I mean, we we, we kind of taking it uh, as it comes you know like uh, the, the the team like kind of started out just from the uh, ambition to to make games basically and and be able to um, do that independently um, and like even the name in between games is basically a joke right I mean it's a joke uh, on the uh, or wordplay on the expression to be in between jobs uh, you know because we we're basically we were like essentially unemployed in the, in, in, in the beginning so we we're like in between games 
Um, so in, in our, our logo is a little like kind of tiny pink uh, elephant on a tightrope. Um, so so it kind of had always like kind of the thing that uh, it, it was a risk and we don't know how long it's going to continue and we still don't really know. Um, we only we can only see That's like the, the next couple of steps ahead of us basically and we have to like kind of take it as it comes. Um, so that's what we're doing now. Right now, we're going to finish this game uh, and, and, and put that out there, and we'll have to see uh, how it continues. We don't, we don't really know. We don't have that kind of uh, security, you know, that, that comes with the freedom. It's, uh, it's, that's, it's uh, a lack the, of security. That is a tricky part about being indie, but uh, yeah. we wish you, uh, you uh, a great success about it. Yeah, so, your last question? Yeah, the last question is a question that we uh, always ask at the end of each interview, but it's not a tricky question. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, the question is what do you think about the video? game industry in your country so okay. Germany and uh, what do you think about the video game industry in France if you have an opinion about it Uh, so yeah, Germany. Germany and video <laughs> game industry is a, is a difficult topic. Um, so so the thing is, like the, uh, the German games industry isn't as strong as the as the industry in uh, in other countries. Um, you know, we we don't have any publishers as big as Ubisoft, for example. That's uh, even remotely within the same like kind of uh, weight class there. Um, we did have like I think some respectable studios and games over over the course of the years. We. Uh, the German games industry was pretty good in like the whole like, kind of browser game kind of thing. Maybe just because PC games and all of that stuff wasn't that strong, and console games wasn't that strong. Um, so uh, like people in Germany were pretty early like kind of going on there. I can go on on this question for a long time actually. Um, but like the bad thing is like that bubble has eventually burst, and like just within the last year, um, the German games development industry lost 10% of its workforce. So like which is which is huge. Like if you if you think about you know we're living in capitalism and capitalism is growth uh, driven. Um, so to have like a, a 10% decline, at least you know in my direct field, which is development, um, there's obviously more like publishing and distribution and all that. Uh, but like within development, to have like a 10% decline is like a huge warning sign. That oh, some just went away. Uh, well, the projects, uh, the projects uh, were sometimes handed to another developer, or like so some of the um, some I of the uh, or, or that, uh, or, or, or some of the studios closed, or like especially like the big browser game studios let go of a lot of people because they had like this bubble where they thought their growth would continue at the same speed, and at some point it didn't. Um, but also, if you if you look at other countries, um, I, I'm not sure like how much uh, incentives uh, France actually has. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, at least you know, for example, the Netherlands or uh, Scandinavia or Canada, as well, they have like uh, tax breaks and all that kind of stuff, or where where like 30% basically of um, the uh, salaries that you have to pay, you know, to people developing the games, 40% of that is like tax-free or some stuff like that. And that is like, and if you look at, uh, we're looking at a global market where games can be produced everywhere, which is awesome, but it also means that you're um, constantly basically in competition with everybody. And it's just, it, it's really, really hard to per default have to be, you know, 30 or 50% more um, basically effective than somebody that comes from a completely industrialized Uh, well-educated, well-developed, you know, in our country. So that's pretty tough. So I hope that when we get like a new government in Germany now, that we we, we might get uh, we, we might uh, see some development there to like help uh, both the games industry, but also like just the digital industries in general. But we'll have to see how or whether that happens. You don't have any uh, help from the state because in France we have this uh, tax-free help. It's I, I think it's 30 percent mm -hmm. in um, France. So. Well, there's, there's, there's some help, um, but it's like it's small and it's regional. Um, so, for example, we also got uh, funding for our game from the Medium Board Berlin Brandenburg, which is uh, um, basically a, f a film funding kind of public institution, and, and and they fund movies. Like movie funding in Germany is great; like it's completely awesome. Uh, and and then basically the games uh, games industry get like some leftovers of that, and then that's what we make this game on. Um, um, but there's no, on, not on a, on a federal level, there's nothing. Um, there's like the Deutsche Computerspielpreis, which is the German com computer game prize, um, which is basically an award ceremony that comes with some money. But there's nothing systemic. There's nothing guaranteed. Um, it's it's yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. Okay. I mean, uh, what is your opinion in France if you have one? <laughs> A perce perception, yeah, exactly. more like what, that. What is your point of view? There is no good or bad answer. It's yeah. interesting, you know, to see a stranger, stranger point of view when you're French. Mm. <laughs> I, th I think French games are like more artistic. I think they have more style um, than than is, is, is usual. If you 
If you look at, you know, like Dishonored, for example, uh, I love the industrial design just in these games and the whole flair of it. Uh, and I think that is, uh, you know, that that is part of what you need to do when you're making games for uh, for a global audience, but also like locally in your market. It's just like have, you know, bring your own twist to it. Uh, and, and I think that that you can see that uh, within games that originate from France, that they just like have a, a, a different flair to them and a different ambience. And I think that that's important and part of the success also that uh, uh, the games from France have. Okay, thank you. So, thanks, thanks very much uh, for, your, for your time. It was a great interview yeah. <laughs> uh, for us. Uh, <laughs> for you, I, I don't know. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> hope you yeah, enjoyed it. Yeah, and I hope you will enjoy your, your time in Paris. I don't know if you often come to Paris, but it's a cool city. So. <laughs> <laughs> There is nightclubs too. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I we can give you a good address. <laughs> I, I'll have to uh, explore the city more. Like, usually when I'm here, I only see like the airport and, yes. and then the convention center, but uh, I, have to, I have to come back and do like a week trip or two. It's the just first time that you come to. Uh, Arimiti, which is the place uh, which uh, is the Knam. Yeah, the Knam, uh, where we are right now for the Indicator. Pretty nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. I uh, yeah. love the architecture and everything. Okay. So, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, good luck. Good with, luck. Uh, with the game. Thanks.